I really like how people have given their kind of personal anecdotes about how they got into this business. And uh, you know, as I was hearing Lynn talk, he, he gave a picture of Nelson Harston, who uh, was, I guess he's in my academic lineage, because he was the advisor of my PhD advisor. So Rhea, uh, Rich Linsky was Nelson Harston's student, and Rich was working on beetles, and I think he got very frustrated with what he could do with beetles, so he moved into E. coli. And I worked with Rich on E. coli, and I got very frustrated with what I could do with E. coli, so I worked with Lin Chao on phage. So uh, you can see the progression model there. I don't know what the hell my students are going to work on, maybe just <laughs> RNA molecules. Uh, so also, we've heard a lot about how let's go for big questions, because you know, why else bother doing what we do? And as an evolutionary biologist, I can't think of very many bigger questions than these. You know, all the world is indeed a phage. We've heard about that uh, a couple of times already today. And so therefore, if they're so damn successful on this planet, we should be able to use them to conquer just about any question that we think we want to address. And here are some very big questions. How do organisms evolve to become better adapted to their environments? The world has a lot of environments. And how do organisms go about becoming better adapted to them? And why is Earth so biodiverse in terms of species and ecotypes? I put ecotypes in in case you don't believe in species. But, uh, <laughs> but really, I mean, these, these are two giant questions that are at the heart of evolutionary biology, and they've really driven my curiosity. The first one I'll talk about in the context of the classic literature, and that's uh, a very famous experiment by two individuals who we've heard about already, and that's Lurie and Delbruck. So uh, eventually I'll get to that, but how adaptation occurs is something that has really interested evolutionary biologists ever since they started calling it that, or even precursors to that. And unfortunately, Lamarck is often remembered as somebody who got stuff wrong, but he actually took a very strong stance about how evolution works. He just didn't get all of it right, and I feel like he should be given more credit that unfortunately he has uh, received the date. Uh, so the thing that he didn't get quite right is that he believed that during, I mean, essentially it comes down to this, during the lifetime of the individual that your traits can change to have you become better suited to your environment. And those traits that have changed during your lifetime are the ones that get passed on to your progeny because they are going to be more successful. Well, Darwinism uh, works off of a different kind of an idea, and that is you essentially have to be born lucky, right? So the population is variable, and it turns out that the variants that better match the environment are the ones that are going to leave more offspring and ultimately, ultimately more grandchildren. So uh, what I really love about Lurie and Delbrook, and I try in every possible case for uh, students at Yale and other places that I talk about this experiment, to have them understand it from the framework of Lamarckism versus Darwinism. And some of the individuals in this room will probably know better than I would, but I heard anecdotally that a lot of that kind of uh, uh, interplay between those two ideas is really what drove Lurie and Delbrook to construct their experiment in this particular way, because they wanted to prove to especially bacteriologists of their time that everything works pretty much the same through a natural selection mechanism that Darwin put forward. So if Adaptive mutations are induced by the environment. You, ex you experience the environment, you change. You may change with a low probability, but you change to match that environment during your, li your lifetime and you do better as a result of it. Then if you set up a set of replicate liquid cultures of bacteria, which we all know start from an, uh, a single source and expand out, then uh, if there's some low probability when they are exposed to phage at some point, a lethal phage, and here I also don't know, I, I had heard that it was phage T1 that they used in their experiments, but I could have that wrong, and maybe somebody will correct me if I had that wrong. But the point is, uh, you should see a variance across these cultures that is very similar to the mean in terms of the survivors in this ordinarily lethal environment. And in contrast, if things work through uh, spontaneous mutations, leading to adaptation, and you have to be born lucky, then if your culture that you grew up within, if that mutation happened early on, and you become exposed to the phage, then you'll have many survivors. If it happened very early on in the growth of that culture, you'll have very many survivors, but there are many instances where it doesn't occur at all. So you get a very high variance across your liquid cultures, and that leads to the variance being much greater than the mean, 
And uh, I just really love how they use what people have called subtle statistical or not so subtle statistical reasoning to understand that spontaneous mutations are what drive adaptation. Uh, so now we do things that are basically riffs on this kind of a system where we want to see that adaptation play out before our eyes. So we use evolution in action or experimental evolution often as our primary tool in my group and in others. And this is uh, what I learned from Rich and from Lynn and my other mentors. Um, but essentially here, what we'll often do is set up our experiments so that there's a single ancestor giving rise to many lineages and different ecological treatments. And over the course of an experiment, we want to see how those lineages either converge or diverge in their ability to handle that challenge through evolution. And, you know, I could show you, uh, actually, let me see if I can do this. There it goes. Okay. So uh, this is really, you know, you pick your favorite phenotype, and you may have some distribution in that trait. You put it through this ecological filter, and you can watch how that trait changes through time on average. That's what those cartoons across the top are showing you. And, of course, we work on microbes, especially phages, so we have a lot of power to infer when we get the whole genome sequence exactly what is that phenotype-genotype association and to go on and to do more work and to prove to ourselves that it's either a single allele or multiple alleles and epistasis and all sorts of elegant uh, things that may be the root cause of the underlying adaptive change. Okay. So um, now I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about this other major question, why are there so many species on the planet? Which is kind of a funny question because we don't really have anything to compare that to. Right? We say that this is a biodiverse planet, and in some senses it is. You don't have one spider species and one phage species. You have a hell of a lot of them. But the question is, why do you have that? And I would say the overwhelming thought as to why you have that is that uh, it's a challenging world to live in, and you're in some environment that's actually made up of a multiple series of challenges that you have to meet. So you better pick one as a selective target and improve in that way and the unfortunate consequence is that you'll probably do worse under some other kind of a challenge, okay? So if you think about that, it's really about we live in a world of things that are on average specialized to do something, and it opens up niche space for other stuff that does it better than you. And that creates a lot of species diversity on the planet. Uh, now this relates to something that Darwin said very eloquently a long time ago during his life, and that is you can have both reproduction and survival as the target, okay? And um, a lot of us focus on the reproduction and not so much on the survival, and Lynn did mention that, and some others have mentioned it earlier on. Uh, so what, what I'm showing here in the middle is uh, another author's idea about how you can think of this from what's called a life history standpoint, where you can invest in reproduction or you can invest in survival, but it's very difficult to simultaneously invest in them both. Another gentleman with a gray beard who's done a lot of work in this area is Steve Stearns, who's one of my colleagues at Yale. And it's essentially this idea that you can't simultaneously maximize everything at the same time, so you just pick something and you go for it, in a sense that selection will do that. And we've talked about that in a couple of review papers lately. Um, now I want to talk about that more in the sense of phage evolution and what phages might be experiencing. The study system that I'll uh, focus on is one that uh, Lynn alluded to in the sense of its segmentation, and this is a system that I worked on in his laboratory. It's Phi-6, it infects Pseudomonas syringae, and uh, it has this segmented genome shown, shown here where more or less all these genes are well characterized, but uh, it's by no means like a T-phage. You know, it's, it's not that well characterized, and we still have to figure a lot of the, um, the biological details out as we go. Uh, for the sake of today, just understand that it seems to be mostly a lytic phage, but I'll draw that into question at the very end. And in the natural world, it infects these plant pathogenic pseudomonads that are often residing on legumes, so we actually can go out into nature and find the phage fairly easily if we find infected plants, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit more at the very end. So we came up with a ridiculously easy phage survival assay, and it works um, pretty intuitively. If you take a cell-free lysate, pick your favorite environmental perturbation, and you can uh, query that lysate at the beginning for how many particles it has that are plaque-forming units, 
expose it to this environmental perturbation, and you come back and you see what the percent survival problem is for that phage in that particular environment. Okay, so you can very easily come up with the percent survival. And uh, what we've done a bunch now to date is to take this phage, and I have to remember, and that's why I put it on the slide, is that we basically grow it at room temperature, 25C. But you can take a population of the phage and expose them to higher temperatures, much higher temperatures than we usually use in the laboratory, and temperatures that are highly lethal to the bacterium that they're trying to grow on. And you can just essentially shock that population for only five minutes, and then as you increase that temperature in only a five minute exposure, you can start to see that way out here at 50 degrees C, you have very few survivors left over. So I've had several individuals in my lab look at the problem of how can the phage overcome this heat shock problem. And this is through the evolution of thermal tolerance. So uh, a couple of former PhD students, Daniel Goldhill and Brandon Ogbenugafer, who have now gone on, uh, they're doing postdoctoral work, and Rob McBride, who was a postdoc who worked on this system, and he now works on algal biofuels. So the kinds of experiments that they've done is to sort of crank through a, an experiment shown on the right, where you have a lysate and you can put it into, say, a preheated PCR block and use that for thermal incubation for a short period at some high temperature. And then whoever are the survivors in that phage population, you plaque them and they'll grow under a normal temperature for, say, five generations in this system. You collect everything up and you crank it through again. Okay, so it's very ridiculously easy to do. And we've chosen these high temperatures out here, such as 45 and 50, because we know that should impose strong selection on the phage population to try to overcome the problem of heat shock. And in our case, we were very interested in, that, okay, if they do that, what is the consequence for their growth under normal temperature? So if you improve in survival, can you just as easily uh, in a correlated way, improve in reproduction, or do you give something up because of it? Okay. So here, uh, just as a snapshot of a typical, typical kind of an experiment we did, in this case at 50C, where the blue lineages here all show a very similar kind of a death response or a survival curve as the wild type, and they were undergoing a mock heat shock at 25C, whereas these, red, these lineages in red we're being selected way out here at 50C, and they do improve. You may not be very impressed by it, but statistically, they do improve in terms of their average survival at the selective temperature. And again, it was only five minutes that they experienced at that. But back here, you have this kind of interesting shoulder effect where they improve to nearly 100% survival at uh, temperatures that were not the selective temperature, but they were pretty close to it. Okay? So anyway, this is showing you that there's a big change in the reaction norm in these kinds of experiments, okay? So what is the explanation? And then I'll get to how this demonstrates a trade-off. So the explanation is that we've always seen that the primary target in these kinds of experiments is what's called P5. It's a protein that's a lytic enzyme that in this case, the phage carries it around with it. So literally you have the, the nucleocapsid um, that is protecting the RNA material and on top of that, they're carrying around this enzyme that helps them get in to the cell to initiate infection. And ultimately, actually, they coat themselves in it and it helps them exit. And at the same time, it lies underneath a lipid membrane, okay? So there is this lipid membrane that's shed and then it exposes the enzyme and that's how they get in and vice versa for how they get out. So absolutely essential, but then again, everything seems to be pretty essential in phages. Uh, now that's where we uh, threw up our hands and we had to do a handshake with some structural biologists because we wanted to figure out a little bit more of when the mutations come in and they alter this target enzyme. And I'll show you in a moment, it's actually one mutation, one huge benefit mutation that they always seem to find first. And I'll show you how that works. Uh, we worked with Yorgo Modis, who um, he recently moved from Yale to Cambridge. And essentially they solved the structure of this P5 protein, which hadn't been solved to date. And here the mutation is shown in red in a couple of different versions. Well, they always seem to find this transversion that's a valine to phenylalanine change, amino acid substitution. And nicely, it all seemed to make complete structural sense in the sense of it comes in and it fills a hydrophobic pocket in that enzyme. 
And of course, if it's filling this pocket, it's going to make the enzyme more stable under high heat. So, so far so good. We've got a big benefit mutation that always seems to come into these thermal tolerance studies and kind of very elegantly this partner laboratory shows us that it fills a, a pocket. So what's the downside of that? The downside of that is what Kate Winslet talked about in uh, Contagion in the sense of she very nicely talked about, well, sh we should or we should not be worried about this mystery virus in the sense of if it dropped down to, to some city center, exactly how many people is it going to kill per time, per infection? And that's R sub zero, which people care a lot about in epidemiology. And in this movie, if you've seen it, it was all about a race between trying to stop the epidemic before you know, the end of the world. Uh, <laughs> just the end of the world. So. Um, the cool thing is that the single base transversion substitution, the single amino acid substitution, radically changes what the plaque looks like for these viruses in the laboratory under the, the normal growth temperature of 25C. And that's what tipped us off to this being a trade-off. So what do I mean by that? These nice big open plaques, that's wild type 5,6 growing on a lawn of Pseudomonas syringae. And instead, we have these V207F mutants creating these weird-looking bullseye plaques, okay? So a bullseye plaque, even if I don't know entirely what the underlying mechanism to create a bullseye plaque is, and I will admit that I don't know what the underlying mechanism to create a bullseye plaque is, it must be that more bacteria are surviving in this little local epidemic than in the wake of a wild-type epidemic spreading out from that epicenter. Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't see that gray zone. And I can tell you for, for real, we can go in there and we can actually culture bacteria out of there. So these are bacteria that are surviving the epidemic. And what does that mean? It automatically suggests to us, as geneticists and evolutionary biologists, that this one mutation is an antagonistically pleiotropic allele, which is a mouthful, but it simply means that it is something that is good for one thing, but it has a liability for something else. So it is good in the sense of it causes better survival at high heat. And the downside is that it causes a weaker epidemic under normal circumstances, and that is lesser reproduction. OK, so here's further evidence of that. This graph on the right to you seems uh, familiar because I showed it to you a moment ago. And that is, again, emphasizing that the one mutation causes a huge difference in survival. But if you now take the wild type, compete it against itself, you get a fitness of one by definition. If you take that thermal tolerant mutant that has only a single substitution and you compete it against the wild type under the normal temperature, it has a big growth disadvantage with a whoppingly huge selection coefficient. Okay? And uh, again, this is showing you the difference between those two um, uh, plaque phenotypes when you look at them. So uh, we are not alone in seeing an effect like this. There was this really cool paper by the, the, De Pep and Today from 2006, where they took many coli phages, very many of them, and looked at how well they reproduced and what their mortality was. Okay? So essentially, those that reproduce better have a higher mortality, which means that they have a lower survival. All right? So coolly, they are finding that all these phages that they tested lie along this line, and they get a very nice kind of a statistical relationship here. So to me, and they didn't talk about this in the paper, the explanation they mostly focused on, which was, I think, amazingly neat, is that they had a way, and don't ask me exactly how they did it because I've never done studies like this, you can look at how tightly packed down the nucleic acid is within the capsid, and I think they actually got the measurements in that paper to say that the tighter packed down it is, the better they survived, and for whatever reason, pretty obvious ones, maybe there's an uncoiling effect or whatever that causes that to be a liability for reproduction. Okay? So that's a mechanistic explanation, if you will, but it doesn't really tell you what the ecological circumstance is for why all these viruses fall along wherever they fall on this relationship. And instead, what we did, this is another way to think about it, is we moved a very closely related system up and down that line. Right? So we imposed the selection that made them improve in survival and gave up more reproduction, and essentially that is possible. I'm not talking about it today, but we've actually seen the same thing in a virus of eukaryotes called vesicular stomatitis virus, and we've had several papers on that as well. Okay, so it seems to be something kind of general is going on in the phage world, and what I just mentioned is it seems to be going on in the virus world as well. 
So uh, exactly what that is in terms of this plaque phenotype, I really wanted to finish up by talking with this because I'd love uh, any feedback from a group like this, a large group of phageologists, in terms of what they think this may mean, and also in terms of whether you've ever seen it in your own laboratories. Uh, some of these kind of bullseye phenotypes, this is a relative of phi 6 called phi 12. I mean, these look like the rings of Saturn. You know, you've got a lot going on here. Uh, the last thing I'll say before I show you a quick video is that we've gone out in nature and looked for these viruses in the family cystovirus, that's what this phage belongs to, this family, by going to white clover plants that seem or not even obviously seem to be infected by bacteria and we can then bring those in the lab and culture up phages off of them. And I will tell you, it's amazingly uh, prevalent when we go and look for them this way, something like 40% of the time we find cystoviruses. So I will say that RNA phages are actually screamingly common, at least in the phylosphere. I don't know anywhere else, but they deserve attention at least there. Uh, and the other thing is we've actually found that mutation enriched in some of these populations. And we've done sampling at like, you know, morning, noon, and night across weeks and across months, and actually can't tell you yet whether there's any correlation with, oh, you find V207F, in populations of these phages that have been exposed to sunlight all day long. It wouldn't surprise me, but unfortunately we couldn't crank through the data before I came to this meeting. Maybe by tomorrow I can tell you that. Uh, okay, so I think I can do this. This is a time lapse of these plaques growing up, and I don't know what it means. <laughs> so you can help me out if you will. There has been this way for people to kind of trick phi 6 into going into a latent state in the laboratory where it's inherited across generations. And that's our best guess is that there's something about this one mutation that maybe causes the phage to undergo a normal lytic infection and then maybe the thing is why would the whole bacterial population at the same time suddenly have this phage and it's being passed on to daughter cells through the cytoplasm and then it switches back and so on and so on to get these rings of Saturn. I'm not so sure how that can happen, but I'd love to hear any of your ideas about how it might happen. Okay? So the people I'd like to acknowledge are the folks in my lab group and these funders, uh, Yorgo Modis, who's now at Cambridge, and his former postdoc, Moshe Dasau, who's at Bar Ilan University, were the structural folks who helped us on the uh, experiments, and I'll take any questions if you have them.